It is week six, it is MKTG 2032, and it is just before the half break, the semester absence of classes for 2022. And we're going to talk about advertising, which is going to be an interesting challenge because your projects that you're working on are at varying stages of maturity. And if you've just gone and started up, you have a twofold challenge of you don't necessarily have enough content to want to draw an audience, but equally you want to draw an audience to motivate you to produce more content. If you are running an older or more mature project, you may be thinking, I know, I'll advertise to get more people. What you need to be thinking is, is my content ready for a larger audience? So it's about, this section is going to be talking to you about a section of decisions that apply irrespective of the age, maturity, or operational status of your project. And also, I'm going to point you to resources that you can draw upon elsewhere. Now, the very first thing we've got to talk about is that there are rules of engagement for social media. And boy, they are worse than you would imagine. So, the very first thing to understand is that it's not just the local operations that run this, it's every jurisdiction has some varying say. In Australia, your big two you want to worry about are linked in the content here, and this is the ACCC will show up and beat up influencers because it makes good copy. At the end of the day, you cannot go ahead and proclaim a message on social media that is sponsored without acknowledging that you've been sponsored. Then to the rules, stick with it. This will open up a couple of challenges here also when we start talking about cross-promotion and trying to cross-promote each other in that we do need to acknowledge if you are getting something back from another student, then it is a sponsored event. If you are just simply shouting out a mate, hey, then it's a little greyer, but uh, basically it should be okay because we're small scale and we're mates giving shout outs to mates. But if that mate slipped you a carton of beer and a $50 note, then it's sponsored. The second thing, uh, it's a longer video. Tom Scott's 30 minute deep dive into the rules and the review of influencer advertiser rules. Tom Scott is based in the UK, so there is a jurisdictional, uh, how should I say, specificness to his work. The general principles apply. You want to be aware of the principles of what counts and why, and why it's quite so different for influencers and online compared to TV, film, and even radio. And that's one of the things is, as a TV series can do product placements without having to put a little flashy beepy light saying paid sponsored stuff, uh, it changes some of the rules of engagement. That said, you still can do, you just follow the rules. So the other thing I want to say is that MKTG 2033 exists. It is the subject on advertising. I am not going to teach you advertising in this slide deck. I'm going to talk about the things that as an e-marketer, you have to immediately deal with that are advertising related and use part of the promotion mix. And I'm going to point you out to say, go look at the resources that exist in this little subject called MKTG 2033. And if you have done the subject, awesome. Congratulations on gaining a bunch of new friends. Those of you currently doing the subject, awesome. Congratulations on your case study that is this project. And those of you who have no intention whatsoever of going near it, that's your choice. And it's an open market and we, we like choice. We're big on that here. So, I also want to talk about a philosophical worldview that I have as a marketer, and that is that the marketing mix is a sequential event. You start with product, you move into pricing. Pricing is then influenced by distribution. And if you're doing services, then you do absolutely everything else in the mix and you come back and you finish off with promotion. Others 
another marketer, it's another marketing lecturer here at ANU, can have a different approach, and that is their approach. This approach is mine, and I want to explain it a little more. I firmly believe that you can't do advertising until you have made a sequence of decisions, and those decisions are heavily impacted by the remaining areas of the mix. You can't communicate a message if you don't know who the audience is. You can stand on the street corner and shout, but that's not communicating a message. You need to know what it is that you are trying to communicate. What is the value proposition? And we know that value propositions through co-creation can vary by target markets. So you're now two for two. You need a target audience. What is it they value? What is the problem they're trying to solve? What is it that my product offer can help them co-create? How do I explain that to them? If you can't answer that initial, if you can't do that initial part, then you can't do your communication. And that also means things like the distribution. You need to be able to work out where is my audience? So where should I be communicating to them? And also, can they reach the value offer? And this is where Siva kicks into gear and becomes really useful. Siva is customer facing and Siva is a good starting point. And you can tell it's a starting point for promotion because it was created by one of promotion's best researchers, Don Schultz. Siva starts with solution, information, value, and access. And information is what does the customer need to know about it, about the solution, and where are they going to hear it from? which means that you are going from what is my toolkit of marketing mix and promotion mix to what do I need the customer to know? What does the customer need to understand in order to be able to access and unlock the value? I might have used Siva a little bit in the course design in case you were wondering, in case you had a, slip, a brief light bulb moment of going, hang on a second, but yes information ties to access because you may need to teach the customer how to use your product. And if you need to do that, then you need to do that through your communication. And one of the earliest points where if you look up the early adverts for the Apple iPod, and the iPod had this particular thing where they had to show people that you could turn it sideways. Up until that point in time, there wasn't a rotational function on a tablet device. These days, it's just like part of the course that um, that's for photography, that's for selfie. But we didn't have this cultural knowledge of rotate the device. So consequently, Apple ran a series of advertising campaigns that literally showed you how rotating the device 90 degrees was beneficial. They knew who the audience was, they knew what the product value proposition was, and they knew what they needed to teach the audience in order for the audience to get the most out of the product. For you, for your project, what you want to be thinking about is if you are ready to communicate, ready to advertise, to promote, to use a promotional strategy, what you've got to be thinking is, all right, what's in it for the audience that I want to attract? And who is the audience I'm trying to attract? Good odds are that you're probably looking for a new audience. So you're thinking, am I in my answer? Where am I in my answer off? Do I, if I already have an audience coming to my social media presence, do I want them to come here more frequently? In which case I will need to maintain my communications message within group and targeting off my own platform to my own users? Or do I want to gain more people? And therefore I'm looking at new users, new, uh, audiences and am I trying to attract them with what I've already got or am I feeling that I've got to say hey come over here it's new similar things you want to be thinking about aspects like the what's the value proposition for them if you're thinking from the perspective of product and product development are you selling them an innovation or are you selling them a me too are you selling them where are they in terms of what they're looking for. And you need to know and be able to communicate value. 
And value, as we know, is a trade-off between cost and benefit. And we know this from pricing. And lastly is segmentation and distribution come together of where is your audience and how you're going to find them. And if you're going to go down the paid advertising path, how are you going to afford them? What happens if you throw a bunch of money into this project? What is the likely return on that investment? Now, for me personally, uh, at the early stage of a project, I would be more inclined to look for partnerships and collaborations, for crossover events, to be able to team up with another channel so that that channel's audience can see you and decide, yeah, you look like the kind of person who's interesting and I want to follow. So what you do there is that you go and in your partnership, you are both providing content to your partner channel and also you are doing a showcase demo reel of why you are an interesting enough person that someone should get involved in following your social uh, media or your web presence. So big things you want to be thinking about here are uh, marketing and communication strategy. Now, there's a classic thing. Everyone's familiar with a model like this. It's a good assignment question. Reality is, uh, it's basically the same steps I've just covered. Select your target market. Who is it you're after? Now, here's what's different. In a formal communication strategy, you start from the position of, who's my audience I want? What is it I want to do in terms of communicating to them? How much have I got to spend? How are we going to do it? What are we going to say? Did it work? You might want to look at this the other way around and say, what is my objective? Who's the audience best suited to that objective? And how am I going to do this? Because I assume you don't have a lot of budget to work with. Also, for the express purpose of this course, I did say that you didn't have to spend extra money. It would be very rough for me to go and say, ha ha, surprise, week six, pro week six it's promotion. Time to go spend some money on your advertising budget. That would suck. That would, that would just be mean. It'd be also probably break the university's rule on not letting me have downloadable content during the semester. So what I'm going to suggest is that instead of going for the big ticket approach, that you use the hierarchy of effects model. Uh, now, we already have the AIDA model out there, uh, Awareness, Interest, Desire, Action. Hierarchy of effects, what you're looking for here is what is it that you want from your communication? What do you want your audience to feel? What do you want them to learn and what do you want them to do? Now, let's take this model across to any cross-promotional event you could consider. And that includes, on a couple of points, I'm going to go and offer to put your content on my social media streams. I've got a Tumblr, I've got a Twitter, I've got an Instagram, and I've got a YouTube channel. So I'm prepared to do a shout out to my audiences. And the question you want to have then is, well, what do you want my, the audiences that are attracted to Stephen's usual content, what do you want them to feel? Do you want them to, is there a uh, particular emotion you want them to feel? Or is there a particular sensation you want them to feel? Could it be curiosity? Now, the learn, you usually, if you're trying to recruit a new audience, you want them to learn that there's a value proposition of interest to them and that they feel positively predisposed to it. And what they need to do, the call to action is subscribe, follow, link, go to, engage. So for you, work through this hierarchy of effects. If you're going to communicate to an audience of people who you are seeing as potential new followers, what is that objective? Why are you communicating? What do you want them to go through? So we have a couple of things and we have a very traditional thing in advertising. You're either doing awareness or you're doing sales. And if it's awareness, you want people to know more, to feel more or be influenced. Now being influenced is a, a fun one because if you have gone out to be an influencer, then one of your obvious objectives in life is to have people listen to you. And have them listen to you means have them learn from you. 
The second area is the action oriented outcomes. Uh, this is normally your sales. So promotion normally has one of two goals, either raise the brand awareness, and that is trigger problem recognition in the consumer behavior model, or it's a call to action, which is to move from desire to action state in AIDA, bottom end of the funnel, behavioral goal, behavioral outcome, behavioral metric, and you want them to do something. Whether it's like, share, subscribe, buy, reply, there is a specific measurable behavior that is your success metric for your communication because if they buy the product from seeing the advert, click through purchase, done, success. The problem is click through rates at the moment, successful click through rates are around one and a half to two percent. And in my career as an online marketer, the highest click through rate I achieved in a paid advert was 3% and people were asking me how I did so well whereas I was off there going saying well I'm not wasting 97% didn't react everyone's like yeah but 3 did average average is like 1.5 so <sighs> most of your advertising will be poorly considered if you're not thinking about what it is to a very targeted audience but also, in the project that you're currently doing, there is some things around advertising, promotion, and PR that is about validating your project and showing that you are a real operation, you're a legit uh, operator, that comes from either cross-promotional work, partnering up with someone, or being sponsored by someone else, the signs that you've made it. However, your big thing is your call to action. Uh, end of the day, we are a behavioral based discipline. We are a behavioral based entity. We want people to do stuff because stuff being done means rewards and outcomes for us as marketers. Which leads us to the application of doing stuff. The things I want to talk to you about in advertising, basically, also, geez, I wish I'd got myself a Pepsi Max sponsorship before I started my career. Cheers, mates. This has not been a paid product sponsor. I just drink that much uh, Pepsi Max on screen regularly. Let's go. Here's the things you're going to do for applied. Branding. The very first thing you've got to understand is that everything on the internet is branded. Absolutely everything. It is the most brand-driven existence ever. It's from the username that you sign on with to the URL that you access something from. It is turtles all the way down. This subject runs brands. Um, YouTube, youtube.com. YouTube is a brand. YouTube is a word that now exists as a result of someone sitting down and saying, what are we going to call our video hosting service? And we're going to call it Oh, I know, um, Tube, that's an old slang for television. Um, geez, what can we call it? MyTube, TheyTube, Rubik's Tube. And someone said, well, hey, what about YouTube? What about make it your TV, your hosting? Um, and then it sort of cascaded from there. But it's a brand. Same, every application is a brand. Every thing that we do, every interaction, goddammit, we have on this internet. The only thing that's not a brand is the internet itself. Like, TCP IP is actually uh, a transfer control protocol. Uh, some things aren't branded, but just about everything else is, including down to what's the web browser you use? And do you say web browser, or, or do you say, load up Firefox, open Edge? No, no, no one says run Internet Explorer. It is a brand. And the thing about this is that you are now soaking in it. Every interaction you've done on a social media platform builds up your brand personality, your brand profile. It's your personal brand, who you are as an internet entity, but also the deliberate choices you get to make in terms of branding within the co-creation, co-customization settings on each of the platforms you're part of. So we'll talk a bit about that.
and also get into Canva, also a brand, and start setting yourself up um, some stuff around the brand style guides. And we'll talk a bit about that in a second. But functionally, just to remind you, for those of you who aren't familiar, what a brand is, a brand tells a story. The logo that we have for this course and its recurrent use of fonts, including some of the font choices you may not necessarily have noticed, like the little in video elements here, the branding choices, the way in which the information is presented to you on the PowerPoint slides, the choice of color schemes, metrics, uh, all these elements. Now, there's a bunch of metrics uh, underpinning this. One of them is the recognition factor of the subject. We are a very distinctly branded entity and are waiting to get into trouble from corporate HQ who will be like, Stephen, that's outside the ANU brand guidelines. And my answer is, yeah, yeah, it is. And that's for a reason. The reason is we want to showcase the story of the wildcard e-marketing subject. It has its own brand. It does things its way. And we even have our own soundtrack. Each, this is the thing to also include here, is that recognizable marks, colors, text, image, schema, audio. The start of each lecture and each of the pre-recorded lectures and each of the pre-recorded content blocks has a little video sting, has a little audio sting that we use as an identifier to build up the brand of the subject. And this is a deliberate choice because obviously yeah, marketer here knows what the techniques are and I've wanted to show them by example to embed them, to build them, to create them, and then to have you go, hey, I know that. So let's talk a couple of theories that I am going to get you to operationalize and do. Brand personality. I love this theory. I've written a couple of papers on it. I think it's one of the most amazing bits of work. Back in the day, Acre in 97, so it's 25 years old, came up with the brand personality framework and they put an enormous amount of work into the creation of that five core. It was rigorously tested, it was brought down from a body of a much larger number of possible personality traits to sort of settle on through the process of mathematical elimination and statistics, the five core personality traits that can be used as building blocks to be the start of the platform of your anthropomorphic description of a brand. Now, the thing about the brand personality theory is that it is based on the idea that humans like to interact with things. If you've read any of the Tumblr, humans uh, will pack bond with anything. We will pack bond with conceptual frameworks. We will pack bond with logos. We will pack bond with anything. And partly we do that because we will uh, ascribe an anthropomorphic, a humanization to make it easier for our processing circuits to go, I like, I don't like. So it's all about us using, now as human to human interactions, a personality clash is a known thing of two radically different approaches to the world. The personalities don't mesh, the personalities don't work. Now in here, the acre, by the way, there are, there's a second paper that's been done in Brand Personality. So there's actually a pool of seven that you can choose from now. The five from the acre, sincerity, excitement, competence, sophistication, and ruggedness. These are funda fundamentals. These are foundational concepts of personas that you can adopt and use as your brand, as the core basis for your brand and your brand's interaction with the world. The thing about it is that the brand personas are also capable of descriptive of you, but also antithesis, oppositional. So I'm not, so under the category ruggedness, I do not meet the criteria for ruggedness. I am not outdoorsy. I do not have that desire to take a 
to head to the outside world that often. So I can have an antithesis brand personality of outdoorsy of that is the this course wouldn't work if it started with country and western and big sweeping um, drone shots of you know cars going through bushes and four wheel drives climbing mountains. You wouldn't believe it and I wouldn't buy it. And also I don't think it would fit e-marketing. So instead e-marketing has a different framework and we're going to get you to explore that framework and we're going to get you to talk about that so I'm not going to give it away, no spoilers. But functionally what you want to do is you want to look at this, get this paper, get the brand personality and say where does my social media presence or my project where would I sit ordinarily, my ordinary day-to-day -day conduct, where do I sit in that framework? And in my YouTube project that I run for myself, I am in the sincerity column. I am under cheerful, honest, and sentimental. There's a little bit of nostalgia, but mostly I am thoroughly enthusiastically optimistic about things, and to the point that it's probably well, I know it terrifies a lot of my friends that I can be that cheerfully, relentlessly optimistic and happy. But that's where I sit. That's the sincerity column. I can lean into that with my brand and make it more. Make it a larger-than-life brand persona. But core to me, that's probably the best way of operating. Now, once you lay down a map for what you think your brand persona should do, what you want to do is create for yourself a brand style guide. And in operating on the internet, you have a bunch of different choices. One of them is your username. Do you want to take a consistent name? Now, I've used my full name across a range of sites. Do you want to take a brand name? I have a brand that I use, uh, but also I've been the brand manager for the Australian New Zealand Marketing Academy, and we try to contain the word ANSMAC and own the word ANSMAC across as many different platforms as we could. Somehow we didn't get Twitter. Uh, someone else, someone whose surname actually worked out, you know, there was something like an Anthony Z Macintosh called themselves an ANSMAC. Uh, it was like, damn it, we lost our brand to a person. Uh, URLs, choice of URLs, where you get to customize the URL. Honestly, I'm waiting to get to do that on my YouTube accounts. I just don't have enough followers yet. It's not a call for you to go follow my accounts. Social media icons. What is your choice? Do you want to present yourself uh, as a photograph or do you want to present yourself as a logo? I tend, I have my own personal brand logo that I run with and I use across a range of platforms. Uh, I also have a set of photos that I choose that I use to, to represent me depending on what it is I want my brand on that platform to be. Similarly, color schemes. My personal color scheme uh, for my logo is purple and gold. My professional color scheme for this subject is on the next page. It's more, it is now currently um, a couple of gold and mauve, and mauve purple. It's a lighter purple compared to a darker purple. And the last thing is, uh, what do you want to represent you in? Things like banner images. And this is the one probably where I've got my biggest weakness because I do get distracted and like to put up shiny photos rather than have something consistently on brand. So briefly, the subject brand book. We use the font Road Rage. That is what the logo consists of. There is another font called Typewriter, which is being used for the graphics here. Uh, all the text that you see on the PowerPoint slide is always in trebuchet. Uh, I try pretty much to exclusively use trebuchet as my text. It is a font that I find easy to read. It is a dyslexia friendly font, which is also uh, why I use it. And for me, trebuchet 10 is kind of like my signature calling card. If you get a document and it's in Times New Roman, you know it wasn't mine. But equally, I have a couple of brand specific brand identity fonts that I use. For this subject, Road Rage is our big identity font. Our colors are in hex code there, but, so if you want to replicate it, that's the colors of the logo, the gold and the uh, purple. 
you will see that there are two versions of the logo. There's the one above me here that has a alternate mode, which is a the lighter uh, purple on top and the darker purple is a shadow. Here we have the dark on top and the light shadow. That was not used for the uh, second logo with the gold outline because the gold outline worked better on the materials that we were applying it to. So we have three logos in effect and a bit of logo rotation to make it work pending what the background will be. And when you look at the ANU style guide, which you will have access to from the Waddle site and from the live learning event, you will see that the ANU also runs multiple different logo variants. It runs a black and white. Oh yeah, I should also point out, uh, the print logo for shirts is very basic white because none of the shadow outline stuff works in print. So we actually have one more logo that I remembered. We have the clothing logo, the PowerPoint logo, the on-graphic logo, and the on-screen logo. All of which basically are two lines of road rage font saying the name of the subject and a course code and slightly overlapping each other. Uh, you will also see that there is a consistent use of brand imagery across the subject. The PowerPoint slides are based on using a Polaroid photo. Uh, that is the 2022 art direction. If you see work from 20, 2020 or 2021, you'll see that we had a different art direction. Because we're doing things differently this year, I changed the art style to reflect the new conditions. Which also means that you will see through the PowerPoint, you'll start to pick up that there is a recurring thematic visual style where I'm using this particular it's actually a photo uh, from a beach down by uh, Ballina that is, that's the skyline. And that is one of the things. There is another logo element. You'll see that the red background that's present here, this is also part of our star book. Now, positioning. Vitally useful thing that you can do uh, with deliberate use and manipulation of the rest of the marketing mix plus some intentional communication. I also want you to think about positioning in terms of as marketers we have a real predisposition to fall towards convenience-based positioning. High volume, low, low cost, high volume sales, fast moving consumer goods. It was the birth of marketing, it's where we originated from but it doesn't have to be everything. And there's a lot to be said for trying to push into either luxury or into prestige where it costs time and it costs effort and it costs money because that's where your bigger profits can come from. Yes, there will be bigger operating costs. Um, if you make your entire product line out of gold, well, that ain't gonna be cheap, so you can't sell it for cheap. But also, why would you want to? You could sell handcrafted gold for more because it becomes premium. It's one of a kind prestige. And this is what your positioning is about. So you should be familiar with positioning strategy. It's the third element of segmentation targeting positioning. Here in the communications are, your job is to understand where your value proposition is naturally headed in terms of the product, what's similar to the product, what's, how is it similar or dissimilar to similar products of its nature, is it priced above market, with therefore more expensive, is it perceived as worth more, therefore more luxurious. You need to understand all those elements so you can start mapping yourself onto a positioning map to start deciding whether your role as a communicator is to reinforce the message that's coming through from the rest of the mix, or to try and counteract some of those elements and push through repositioning. It's really fun, by the way. Positioning strategies and positioning mapping is also really important to understand who are your rivals and who are your allies. Because you can get into a good feud. If you can find a contraposition who is willing to work with you to run a kayfabe feud, uh, think pro wrestling, think kayfabe, and 
you can get a good set of cross traffic happening. All right, positioning strategies. I'm going to point you to this and say it's in your intro text. Go back and have a look. But basically, you do also have an opportunity where you are yourself and understanding your own positioning. I have a distinctive positioning within my department, within the Research School of Management. I am known for several things. So I can actually position myself in terms of both image differentiation. You walk through the RSM corridor, you know when you found my office. I also have a product positioning in that I am known for my consumption of Pepsi Max to the point that at conferences people have said, you're looking for the guy holding the Pepsi Max bottle. And that's how people have found me. But also, I can be positioned on things like my personal uh, personal style, the way my, I approach things, my wild card, propensity to go, hey, I've got an idea. And also the fact that I do things differently because as an innovation adoption researcher, I'm like, welcome to the new shiny, I'm chasing that. All these things are places upon which you can go and make strategic decisions to pursue or to accept. Now, some aspect of the positioning strategies associated with the Stephen Dan brand is also me just sighing at the world and going, all right, I accept that that is how it is. It is how I am perceived by others. Therefore, there's not a lot I can do about it. I might as well lean into it if I like it or just accept that that's how it's going to be. Also, my positioning strategy at the ANU for you is compared to the other three lecturers you have access to this semester. So I sit on a very complicated positioning chart of who's on the elements around me. All right, promotional mix. Back in intro, you would have encountered this. Here, I'm going to point to it. It's really hard to point on this. There we go. I'm going to point to it and say, have a look. Go look it up. It's a huge, massive, divergent area. There are a couple of ones I think are really useful. Uh, and I'm going to talk to them. But basically, it's time to break out to Google Scholar. Think about what you're doing. Think about whether you have the money to run advertising. Uh, are you better suited to doing personal selling? You, in conversation with others, saying, oh, you should follow my Instagram account. Do you want to do something that goes and says, hey, the next 50 followers get 10% off? Uh, do you want to, how do you want to do, and ultimately you have to look at this toolkit and go, I want to pick one of these. But obviously I want to raise a couple of the things. The one we're all familiar with and the one that we block the hardest using Adblock is advertising. YouTube is full of it. And also there's a lot of advertising there. Your area of interest is can you get to the point that an advertiser is willing to spend money to have their content put in front of you. And YouTube's monetization rules change quite a bit and I don't qualify for monetization on any of my channels. So I'm just gonna be sour about it and go to the next slide. Because this is where I think the real money is. Now, knowing that you have to disclaim paid promotions, knowing that you have to announce when something is a sponsorship. I think that this is the world that we are absolutely in position to do better. And let's start with a couple of things that I think, you know, I'm more than happy if someone wants to uh, throw up a suggestion, we have a big sponsorship discussion outside of the class. I used to work in sports, uh, sports ratings agencies, sports sponsorship and corporate hospitality opportunities in Australia. And there is so much more we can do. This whole field is just the beginning. It's the tip of the iceberg. Because if you go away from thinking about the big ticket, and I've got Dom Tomato up there. I follow his channel on YouTube. He's good value as a parkour, uh, an Australian parkour expert whose specialist areas are falling off things from a great height in a controlled manner. Red Bull sponsors him. And it's always been hysterical to me watching 
how he puts his Red Bull sponsorship into the stuff he does. But also, he's been sponsored by so many clothing brands now because this is a guy who goes out and does parkour yeah, looking like he stepped out of an Ed Hardy's rather than he's uh, wearing... You will see him doing parkour in you know, button-up shirts because he worked out that A, he could do this, and B, people would pay money to put their shirts on him whilst he was doing it. But for you, you, the, the startup, the new uh, platform, here's where the money can be done at small level. It doesn't have to be big. Your sponsorship can be through product placement and, for example, you want to do a cooking channel, don't go to Woolworths. You're not going to get Woolworths. They're not going to go to you and say, well, you got uh, virtually no subscribers and no content. Yeah, sure, here's a bucket of money. Go to the literal local greengrocer. Go to the people who are closest to you and say, hey, I would like, I'm wanting to do this cooking show. I would like to work with you to increase the number of people who come here to buy stuff from you. What have you got that's special? What have you got that's distinct? What have you got that's new? And are you willing to give it to me for discount in return for promotion? Start working up the barter and trade so that as you grow your project, as you get more experience, it's easier for you to continue supporting the little operatives who have been with you since the start, but then have the bigger operatives go, well, they're connected. They're show That's a showcase of how they could use products. I'd like my product to be in there. And this is... The thing to remember is that there are advertising agencies and marketers out there looking to put their product in front of audiences. You want to show that you are a channel, a medium, a mechanism that is capable of supporting that sort of message. Now, I will admit, I have thought about sponsoring my courses for nearly 20 years now, but I have not done it because this is a sponsored project. The Australian National University is the primary sponsor. And you pay the uni to access these courses, so I'm not going to on-sell promotional space to products in this course. God, I wish I was sponsored. I really do. Uh, I'm not. Doesn't matter how often I do that. Your key, your absolute key here is how can you showcase? And we have a couple of, there's a bunch of th stuff on sponsorship theory here. But the big one is if you're going to do a particular type of lifestyle sponsor, a lifestyle activity. So you're doing an Instagram and it's a sports Instagram. Well, you, chances are you're going to be wearing sporting gear. Go those logos are going to be there. If you're creating content, chances are you're creating content to make things. And if you're doing prosumption-based content creation and you are consuming something for the purposes of creating the value to demonstrate it to another, there is an opportunity here for you to build up the portfolio of work that says this is a place to put paid content. Uh, now, also, I want to say that it's kind of funny, as I was preparing these slides, Tom Scott, the guy from the opening 30 minutes of This Is Why I Will Never Have a Sponsor, actually had sponsored advertising on their channel. I'm like, hello, thank you. The key to remember is that content can be sponsored and you can be sponsored. You can sponsor a specific behavior and you can sponsor yourself. You can be Stephen Dan, brought to you by Pepsi Max. Or you can be, today's advertising and promotion class is brought to you by Cobbler. Cobbler, the leading brand in marketing thinking. However you want to do it. I really got to start taking money for these things. This is, to me, the biggest area that we haven't fully tapped into. The next biggest area is product placement. And now product placement to me is 
very, very specific in social, both social media and contemporary e-marketing. It needs to be product relevant. It needs to be contextually relevant. You need to be showcasing the product during the episode. Now, again, I watch the uh, Diesel Brothers um, YouTube channel because it's also hysterically funny to me to watch this uh, for all the various accidental product placements that they have atop the actual branded paid sponsorship things they do and they do routinely have adverts and sponsorship elements they do have some of the most hysterically accidental product placements that a marketer notices but the deliberate one here the bro dozer recovery rope yankum ropes are manufacturers of a particular type of rope that's used in vehicle recovery. The Diesel Brothers have a specialization in doing vehicle recoveries. They have their own monster truck called the Brodozer, and now there's a many parts, totals all the way down, Brodozer recovery rope which is a product placement for Brodozer on the Yankum rope, which is product placed inside the Diesel Brothers. Oh God, it's just circular. Uh, end of the day, it's a cross promotional venture between two organizations, the makers of recovery ropes and the people who go out and do recoveries. And together, it is a useful partnership because it's a functional partnership showcasing their respective elements in this case, the Brodozer rope gets showcased doing the job during the YouTube episode. Uh, perfect combination of, I have a product, I want to demonstrate the product in use, I want to demonstrate it to an audience who would be interested in it, here is a partnership. All right, the theory and application. Let's talk about, again, this is the training of, here is an article, and the article's on social media um, influencers. And it's a conceptual framework. Now, these are really interesting for me because conceptual frameworks are my bread and butter. I make, I've made several of them in my career. What you can do with an idea like this, when you come across something like a conceptual framework, is that you can put that framework into practice. You can test it out and say, all right, here's the idea. Here are the different things that you could do with stakeholder engagement. You want you know you need to talk to people more than just your audience. You know under the definition of marketing, creation, communication, delivery, and exchange of an offering that has value for customer, client, partners, society at large. Partners and society at large are part of the stakeholder frameworks. There's a whole line of research in stakeholder ma management, stakeholder marketing. Here, this paper has a list of ways in which Social media influencers can be used to engage with stakeholder communications, what to expect, how it works, and the key ideas. And what you are looking for here is a really interesting matchup between does this influencer have the ability to influence the audience I want it influenced? And in which case, as a result of doing the work they're doing, the content creation, getting the reach through their channel, Am I going to exert influence? And that's your extraction from this paper, and that's my extraction from this paper. And again, the reminder why we're doing these is we want you to be able to pick up, go on the Google Scholar, pick out a journal article that's relevant to the area you're working on, and feel confident that by taking out that one idea that you are using the paper, and you're using it, and you can then cite the use of that idea when you're doing your documentation for the assignments in this subject. And also, whenever, wherever someone says, with reference to theory, this is what they're looking for. They're looking for you to use ideas from others to justify, to validate, to expand, and to explore. So that's your training. If you need me, you know where to find me uh, on the old uh, self-branded on the social media on the very heavily branded email address because that's both my brand name and the ANU's brand name. And with that, enjoy the semester absence of teaching and we will be back in the case study mode when we return in episode seven, when we start talking about 
applications of things you can do with the internet across different formats.